Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart and mind. We thank you for the revelation of it. We will take hold of it, be hearers and doers of it, and it will bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated, if you would. Today we're going to share with you on the subject of understanding works. This is an important subject, and I trust that you are teachable, ready to look at the Word of God, what the Word of God says. Because we need to know what the Word says, not follow traditions of men. We begin in Philippians 1, verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has begun a good work, and this work is going to be accomplished through his word. And it's going to happen as you and I take hold of the word and do the things that he says. Now, our works are important to the Lord, and we're going to discuss this subject, understanding works. There has been quite difference of teaching in the body of Christ, and there's been much error that has been taught on this particular subject in relation to salvation and righteousness. In Romans chapter 3, we begin in verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, talking about the Old Testament law, that shall, there, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law brought the knowledge of sin. What was sin? And notice this says no flesh. That would be a human being, a flesh. They haven't come in line, they haven't been born again, they haven't come in line with the things of God. That which is of the flesh is still is a body of death that we have. It's certainly not been changed whatsoever. In order to be justified, we have to become a new creation. We have to be born again. We have to get a brand new spirit on the inside of us. So no flesh could be justified. This means to be rendered righteous or declared righteous. It goes on and says in verse 21, Now... The righteousness of God without the law is manifested. And that's the key for us to come to the place of being righteous. It was witnessed by the law and the prophets, but this righteous, righteousness <clears throat> has nothing to do with the law, the Old Testament law. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. How does it come? It comes through Jesus Christ by faith of Him. Upon all, unto all, and upon all them that believe. Believers... Those who operate in faith and believe in Jesus are the ones that can come to this place of being righteous. For there's no difference. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So nobody is right with God until they have faith in Jesus Christ, receiving Him and getting born again. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. This tells us how this was able to come to us. We've been declared righteous, how? Freely, how? By God's grace, by His favor toward us, through the redemption. Otherwise, the redemption that Jesus accomplished was showing forth the grace of God towards man because of the fall of man to bring Him to the place of being able to be rendered righteous freely. It was by the grace of God that this happened. We see in verse 25, how did this happen? Whom God set forth to be a propiti propitiation through faith in his blood. Jesus was the sacrifice who paid the price for the sins of mankind as he paid that ransom price, accomplishing redemption. And through faith in his blood, of what his blood did, it paid the price for us as he died for our sins to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Goes on and says, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Whose righteousness is it? It's not ours. It's his righteousness. And who's the one who's just? That he might be just. He is the righteous one. And he's also the justifier or the one who declares us righteous. And who's it to? Of him which believeth in Jesus. So where is boasting then? There's none. It's excluded. By what law? Of works? No. But by the law of faith. So through our faith, we come to the place of being justified, being rendered righteous. It takes faith to receive Jesus, to be born again, to get a brand new spirit, to come into relationship with Him. We go on down to verse 28, and he says, Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith 
without the deeds of the law. In other words, just keeping the Old Testament law could never bring them to the place of being righteous. Now we come over to chapter 4, and we speak here about, speaks about Abraham. And he says in verse 2, If Abraham were justified by works, he hath word of glory, but not before God. Was Abraham justified by his works only? No. But we're going to see later that his works were involved. You'll see a little bit later. But this is referring to and implying being justified by works only. He would have the glory, but not before God. Well, God wants us to understand that being coming to the place of being right before him is through belief and faith in him. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Where was this from? This is actually back in Genesis and chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. And notice it said, speaking of Abraham, he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. It was accounted to him. That shows you that it was faith. This is before the law came into being. This is before anybody was circumcised into the law. This is before the Old Testament came into manifestation. So again, we see that a person being reckoned as righteous was all apart from the law, and it all comes through faith. Now, we come down to verse 4, and it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Otherwise, if I could just do certain works, and that would cause only, and that would cause me to, to merit a, a, the reward of getting, being declared righteous and being right with God, then it would be of debt. God would owe me that because I did something instead of grace. Grace shows that it's a free gift, and it's coming from God. Otherwise, God's the one who sets the, the ways of how we come to something. It's not by us just being a good person or doing good things. See, the world out there thinks if I'm just a good person, then I'll be okay. That's just by your works only, apart from receiving Jesus. No, it's never going to happen because someone had to pay the price for our sins so we could get born again and get a new spirit and become a new creation. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Again, faith is what produces righteousness. He says, as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. So here he's talking about how faith is what is going to produce this. Now, we come down to verse 9. And he says, Come at this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. Upon the circumcision or upon the uncircumcision. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. It came to him before he was circumcised. So again, it had nothing to do with the law whatsoever. He says, how was it reckoned? Was he in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. He was not in a covenant relationship with God at that point in time. And so we see that it had absolutely nothing to do with coming into a covenant relationship. It has to do with being born again, and that is important. We see in Romans chapter 4, verse 13, For the promise that he should be an heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Again, the promises are also according to righteousness as well. If they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. Again, coming back to if the Old Testament law, just keeping it, would produce everything, then the promise has no effect. Faith is made void. Why do we need faith? We just do good works and everything is fine. And that's all we have to do. But of course, that's not so. Now we come down to verse 16 and he says, Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace, God's favor, to the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Now, we come over to chapter 5 and verse 1, and we see it says, Therefore, being justified or declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, we've seen that faith is necessary for us to come to the place of being righteous. Of course, when we are faith, we receive Jesus as personal Lord and Savior, get born again, and get a brand new spirit. Now, down in Romans chapter 9, verse 11, it speaks here 
For the children, being not born, neither having done yet, neither have done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. So here it has to do with God initiating a calling, otherwise not just us doing whatever we want. God had to call us. It means it shows that it's God's making the initiation to reach out to man, which is what he did in order to call us. He's called us out of darkness and the marvelous light. He's called us to receive Jesus. He's called us, called us to come and receive the redemptive work of Jesus in order to be born again. So God is calling, and here it says here that it's not according to election might stand. What we talk about, the fact that this election might stand, is a subjunctive mood verb. The word election, by the way, means you're choosing. It's saying that the purpose of God, according to his choosing, might stand if the conditions are met. That's another point. Otherwise, the conditions have to be met if this thing is going to stand and be continual in your life. And it's of him that calls you as you have to respond to the call of God of what he has told us to do. You must understand that God determines the conditions whereby he who he chooses according to his purpose, and it's not man doing something to make God do something. It's God setting the rules. God sets the rules. He has laid down that, and he's the one that's called us and told us what we're to do. Well, what was the problem with the Israelites? In the Romans 9.30, what shall we say then? The Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. They got it, and they didn't even follow after it. Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, they have not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. They thought if I just do the works of the law only, then that's all I need to do. They stumbled at the stumbling stone. And who was that? That was Jesus. I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Otherwise, you must receive Jesus and believe on him if you're going to come into that place of being able to be righteous. They tried to do it and they rejected him. That's why they have never come to the place of being righteous. Now, another thing that we see over in Galatians, he also addresses the subject Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified or declared righteous by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For the, by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Again, he's bringing the same thing and he's dealing with the ch church at Galatia. We see in chapter 3, in verse 10, see, these guys went back into the law, and they thought they'd be okay by walking in the ways of the law. Galatians 3.10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, because the works of the law can never bring you to relationship with God. You're still under sin. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. Otherwise, they're under the curse. This tells you something. All the people that have gone back into doing the Old Testament law today, which is most all of the messianic congregations, are cursed because they've gone back under the law. They, they, you know, they're under the works of the law. They're under a curse. It's a great mistake in the body of Christ. We see many people that think that the New Testament was an add-on to the Old Testament. We're supposed to do all of the law, Old Testament law and New Testament law. Error. Not so. That is a mistake, because the covenant has changed. Verse 11, No man is justified by the law on the sight of God, as it evident for the just shall live by faith. Again, we see he's pointing this out, driving this home to them. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Now, if you put yourself under the law, now you're going to live in them, and you do them. You're talking about the Old Testament law. Now you are accountable to that, and, of course, there's no way you're going to be able to keep it all. And the guy who puts himself under the law, the Bible said he's under a curse. No, that's a mistake. We don't want to walk that way whatsoever. 
Now, over in Ephesians, chapter 2. So we're, you're seeing that all those people that think that we keep the Old Testament law are under a curse today. They are making a mistake. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. That includes whole denominations. There's denominations that keep all the dietary laws, and they keep all the laws of the Old Testament. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God. See, God's grace is his favor shown toward us in his gift toward us. And the fact that when man was in sin, Jesus came in order to pay the redemptive price, in order to bring us to the place of being redeemed so we could then receive Jesus and come into relationship. We could do nothing to make it come to pass ourselves. Not of works, lest any man should boast. If your works merited your salvation or righteousness, you could boast before God. But there's nothing that you can do to boast before God because it is nothing that you do of yourself that is going to produce it. You're talking about your own works only. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us. We've been saved through the mercy of the Lord. By the washing, which is the bathing of regeneration, which means the new birth. This is talking about the spiritual birth, the spiritual bathing, which is a spiritual baptism, because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what brings us into the body of Christ. We've seen that out of 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. And so it's the new birth that produces the salvation in our life. That, of course, many people today in denominations think that just doing works, being a good person, doing even just the works of the law without receiving Jesus is going to produce salvation. Not so. It's not going to produce it at all whatsoever. Now this brings us to another point, though. So what we've seen so far is that the works of the law will not produce it. And we've seen about the works as the works of the flesh, there's the works of man, there's the works of the Old Testament law, all these things. But now we come to James chapter 2, and we see something else. Now all the Word of God fits together and it all is important. We don't just take one part and ignore another part. You've got to look at it all, and the Scripture is not broken. It cannot be broken. It all fits together. James 2, verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he has faith, and if not works, can faith save him? Now, we're talking about faith and works. Before, we were talking about just works, and how works alone couldn't save you. The works of the Old Testament law, only through faith in Jesus Christ. We never heard about this part, though, now, until James addresses it. Though a man says he has faith and hath not works, can faith save him? The answer is no. So that tells you something. It's not just faith only. There's something else involved. Here, we need to realize that there's works of man. Again, there's works of law. There's works of the flesh. There's works that a person can do in their own, own will and also all the things that they choose to do. None produces salvation. The only one are the works. There's works of faith, though. And so it's faith plus works. And what kind of works would this be? Works of faith. He goes on and gives an example. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to him, Depart in peace, be warm and filled, Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful for the body. What does it profit? It doesn't profit them at all, unless you did something to minister to their need. Even so, faith, if it has not works, is dead, being alone. This tells you something further. There's something about faith. Faith also has works of faith to it. Faith alone is dead. Faith has to have works. As it says, it's to have works. Now, when we see about this, if it's having, this happens to be a subjunctive mood verb. Now, if you're here for the first time, we explain these things. The subjunctive mood expresses things that are contrary to fact, that are conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, faith, if it 
may have, the way you would translate this, if it may not have works, it's dead. Meaning that works has to come along with faith for it to be alive. In other words, we want you to catch this, faith has more than just faith to it. Faith, if it, talking about faith, may not have works, it means faith can have something. Faith will have works. So we see that we have faith, but we also have works of faith. If we just have faith only, it's alone, it's dead. But if we have faith plus works of faith, because the it is referring to faith, having works, then it's going to be that which is going to produce results. Now, James 2.18 says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. I will show you that my faith by my works. Now we see something else. Faith has works, as we just saw. And here he says that the way someone sees your faith is through your works. How can you show the faith without works? You can't. You only show your faith by my works, he's saying. This is the way you're going to see my faith. So you can't show faith without works. That is an important point. Thou believest there's one God, thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble, of course. You know, they believe, but there's nothing they can do in order to get coming out of where the state they're in because they're in everlasting chains of darkness. They, they're done. They're finished. They're, they're set. Verse 20, he says, Wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith, vain means devoid of truth, devoid of truth, that faith without works is dead. That tells us something. If faith is going to produce salvation and righteousness, and yet faith without works is dead, does faith alone produce it then? No, because faith is dead. There has to be works of faith coupled together with faith for it to be alive and to be operative and to produce. Verse 21, was not Abraham our father justified by works? Remember what we read in Romans? It said it was justified by faith. And we saw in Genesis 15, 6, that he was justified uh, because he believed it was accounted to him as righteousness because of his faith. Now we come down to, he says, wasn't he justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, upon the altar? That's right. His works also that showed forth his faith that he believed that God would raise him from the dead if he did sacrifice him because he said, this is the seed, and that God would raise him from the dead if he did sacrifice him on the altar. Seeing thou how faith wrought with his works, working together with his works, by works was faith made perfect. What kind of works are we talking about here? We're not talking about works of the flesh. We're not talking about works of man. We're talking about works of faith. Works of faith, coupled together with faith, brings your faith to the place of perfection. And notice it says here that wrought, or this means to work together, faith working together with his works. And what was his work? It was a work of faith in doing what God told him to do, obedience to God, which he told him he was supposed to go up there and offer his son. The scripture was fulfilled which said, Abraham believed God. It was imputed unto him for righteousness. He was called the friend of God. Otherwise, it was fulfilled because what? Because his faith was made perfect by his works. In other words, works of faith are important. Now, the next verse is very important to notice. Here's the conclusion. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Well, I thought we read in Romans and in Galatians that man could not be justified by works. It's talking about his works, works of the flesh, works of man, or works of the Old Testament law, apart from faith. This is not talking about works of man. This is talking about works of faith. 
how can you have works of faith? Well, you got to have faith first, and then you have works of faith. They combine together. Remember, your works of faith brings your faith to perfection. So what he says, see then how that by works a man is justified or declared righteous and not by faith only. That makes a straight statement. Righteousness requires faith and works of faith. Now that doesn't go over with a whole lot of Christians today because they have gotten an error. One of the primary teachings that you see in in great amount of the Christian teaching today is you're saved by faith alone, by faith only. Yet the scripture contradicts that by saying that a man is justified or rendered righteous, declared righteous, which is what happens, salvation produces, by works and not by faith only. That means the teaching that says faith only is a lie, right? That's the truth. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. She had to do something to show that she really believed in God. She hid the messengers. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It also brings here something important. Your body has the spirit in it. If your body does not have your spirit in it, is there any life in it? No, it's dead. It's lifeless. The same thing is true. Faith without works, what kind of works? Works of faith is dead also. That means faith alone doesn't get things done. It's faith plus works of faith. And this is extremely important. Now, then how does a person get saved, get born again? Well, they believe that Jesus Christ, the gospel, they believe that Jesus Christ went to the cross, paid, was made sin, paid the price, the ransom price, went down to hell for three days and three nights, paid that price, born from the dead, first born from the dead, and now he's the savior of the world, and now we can, he brought, got, brought us into covenant relationship with the Father through the new covenant that he made, and when we receive Jesus, we get born again, right? So, we have faith, we believe in Jesus, but there's something more that we must do. If a person says, I believe in Jesus, that's great. But does that mean they've received him? No. I have lots of people, I've said, you know, just present the gospel to them, and they say, well, I, I believe in Jesus. And I say, that's great. Believing in Jesus is one thing, that's faith. But have you ever received him as your personal Lord and Savior? This believing in him didn't produce the new birth. You've got to receive him. Look at the scripture in John 1, 12. As many as received him, to them gave he power or the right to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name. I believe on his name, but what do I need? That's faith, but what do I need to do? I've got to have some works of faith. If I believe, then I'm going to receive him. What's my work of faith? Receiving him as my personal Lord and Savior. That is my part. See, the work of faith is, part, is your response to God's, what God says for you to do. Faith, we believe, and then we receive him as our personal Lord and Savior. That is the work of faith on our part. Another example, Romans chapter 10, verse 9. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God's raised from the dead, you'll be saved. Believing in our heart, that's faith. Confessing with our mouth that Jesus our Lord, that is a work that you and I speak forth to receive him as Lord and Savior. With the heart man believes unto righteousness, I believe, but there's something more. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So your work of faith, coupled together with your faith, produces the salvation. Let's look at another example. 
Verse 13, I believe in what Jesus has done. Romans 10, 13 says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, that's another additional thing than just believing, isn't it? i got to call on the name of the Lord and receive Him to be saved. So what does that show you? When you believe and then you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved or born again. So, again, this is important. Let's talk, let's talk so another place where we talk about works of faith. Luke chapter 11, verse 13, says... If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? Well, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and I believe the Holy Spirit's supposed to come into me after I'm born again, as the Scriptures teach. Because I believe in it, does that mean the Holy Spirit's come into me? No. I have faith for the Holy Spirit to come, but i got to do some works of faith so it does come, which is what? I'm going to pray to the Father for Him to give me the Holy Spirit. That's my work of faith in order to see the Holy Spirit come to dwell on the inside of me. Let's bring it to another one. James chapter 5, verse 14. Any sick among you? Well, this healing belongs to us in the, body, in the course of what Jesus did. Healing now belongs to us as part of the promises of God because he's, he's accomplished that. Not only redeemed us from sin, but also from sickness, disease. So, I believe... He's my healer. I believe in his healing. Many people say, and I heard it for, I heard it for years, I'm believing God for his healing. I'm believing God. That sounds like a great thing. I'm believing God to heal me, or I'm believing God is my healer. Well, that shows faith, doesn't it? But does that have any works of faith to it? No. You just expressed faith. What's your work of faith? To receive that which is available to you. He says, let him call for the elders of the church, let him pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. Prayer of faith will save or heal the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. That's the work. Your work is you come to the elders of the church, they're going to pray over you, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. They're going to pray a prayer of faith, it's going to save or heal the sick, and the Lord's going to raise you up. So that's the work of faith. Here's another one. People say, well, I believe that Jesus Christ will deliver me from all these demonic spirits. That's great. You have faith that He will deliver you from all these bondages in your life that have come in from inheritance and sins and victimization where spirits have come into us. That's good. These signs shall follow them that believe. I believe. I believe in His deliverance. Well, that's faith. But is that producing the deliverance? No. In my name shall they, the believers, cast out devils. We have to cast them out in order to see the results. So many say, I'm believing God to heal me or deliver me or prosper me. That shows faith in their heart, but it doesn't produce the results unless you work your faith, having a work of faith to see the result come to pass. Well, how, what is my work of faith? Doing what the Word says, putting your faith in operation to see a result come to pass. For instance, when you hear the word, what does it do? Romans 10, verse 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So, you heard the word, you got faith. You heard the word on for some, something, what it might, let's say for healing. And so I have faith for healing. That's great. Does that mean that healing is coming just because I believe that word? No. Hebrews chapter 4 says, let us fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached. When the words preached, it brought faith to you, right? I heard the word, it brought faith. As well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them. Even though it produced faith in you, did it produce results? You could hear the word, but it doesn't mean it produced that in your, <coughs> in your life not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. In other words, I have to do something with my faith, mixing my faith. Otherwise, as I believe, but I'm going to work my faith to put it in operation. We see even how the spirit of faith is to be put into operation and work. 
in 2 Corinthians 4.13. We having the same spirit of faith as according to written, I believed. Okay, that's one thing. That means I have faith because I believe the word. Therefore have I spoken. Well, why am I speaking? Because the speaking is the working of my faith to speak things into being, to bring the promise to pass. Whether I'm praying a prayer of faith, believing I receive, whether I'm speaking to a mountain, commanding it to be removed, whether I'm speaking a promise into being, I'm speaking. Therefore, we believe and therefore speak. In other words, the believing is faith. The speaking and or doing of the word is the works of faith, which must come into operation in our life. So, we must work our faith by doing what we hear. When we act upon the word, then and you do what it says, you're going to take hold of that promise, and what's going to be the result? You're going to have fruit. Fruit is the evidence of our works of faith, the results coming to pass. So what work of faith are you doing to produce results? Remember, it's not you meriting anything because of your works. You can't merit anything. God's the one who's got set the rules down. You do what he says, and then he produces things. You don't decide anything. You just do what he says. Your work of faith is doing what God says, working what his word says to bring forth his promise. And that is his grace or favor toward us because the promise of God has been given to us by him. We didn't do anything to merit it. He's already given it to us. It belonged to us already. All the promises of God are yea and in him, amen. But we have to have faith in that and then works of faith to receive a promise. So this is why, like the Bible talks about, Hebrews 4, 16, this is where we come down to be an endure of the word, not a hearer only. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain, it's a Greek word, lambano, which means to take or take hold of mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. This is our work of faith, coming to take hold of mercy and to find grace, as we pray, we're coming to the throne of grace to see these things come to pass. We also see in Romans chapter 5, verse 21, it says this, As sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace, this is a subjunctive mood verb, it's dependent upon whether you meet the conditions, grace reign. God's grace is his favor towards you. Is it automatically reigning in your life? No. It reigns how? Through righteousness. Well, what produces righteousness? We already saw. Faith plus works of faith produces righteousness unto eternal life. Therefore, your works of faith are very important. Now, believing alone, we've already seen, doesn't produce righteousness or does it produce salvation. Salvation and righteousness are produced by faith and works of faith. This is why, for instance, those people that believe that if I'm just baptized as a baby that I'll be saved, a whole lot of groups believe that. Well, is that in line with the Word? No. Being baptized, did that person show faith in Jesus? No. They don't even know what they're doing when they're baptized as a baby. They haven't come to the place of belief and faith yet. You've got to come to the place of belief and faith and then receiving Jesus as personal Lord and Savior. So this is a case where people are doing works, but they're not works of faith. They're works of what man decided instead of doing what the Word says, thinking that if I'm baptized, that produced the fact that now I'm saved as a baby when I can't even come to the place of belief at that point. That's why all baptisms of baby was n did nothing for you spiritually whatsoever. Hearing the word produces belief and faith, but doing the word are the works of faith that bring forth results. Let's give another example. Mark chapter 11. I hear the gospel that says that I can speak to mountains and command them to be removed, 
and they will be removed, a spiritual mountain or a hindrance in my life. Mark eleven twenty three. 23, Whatsoever shall say to the mountain, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, who have whatsoever he saith. So I believe that. I have faith. Is that producing the mountain being removed? No. Not until I work my faith by starting to speak and command the mountain to be removed. When I speak and command, that is my work of faith going in operation that's going to move the mountain so it's going to be eliminated. In other words, you're going to have some action upon the word, which is so important. This brings us to the place of understanding that works of faith are absolutely necessary, otherwise your faith is dead alone, it's doing nothing. It's not just believing only. It's believing, having faith, and doing works of faith. Look at what it says over in Philippians, chapter 2, verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as you've always obeyed, not as my presence only, how much, now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. How do I work out my own salvation? By obeying. That's my work of faith continually that's going to produce what? My salvation in my life. But now, is this me doing this apart from God? No. Because it goes on and says, because it's God that's working in you. Who's doing the work? God is doing the work. But what put him into operation? your obedience, which is your work of faith, to see him accomplish the work, working in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now, are you earning it by always obeying? No. You're releasing him to produce the results in your life because you're doing what he told you to do. So who's doing the work? God is doing the work. You just assist in putting him in operation with your work of faith by obeying what he told you to do so he can accomplish the work in you. You got faith for what God will do because you heard the word. But you put God in operation by doing the word so he can do the work in you. So it's not me producing it. It's God producing it. I'm not making God do something. I'm releasing God to do what he already said is to be done if I will just obey him. So it's not of man. It's everything is all of God. Now, here's another thing. I've had people say, well, I'm just going to believe that all the demons are gone. Because the Bible says that, you know, he's my deliverer. Well, that's great. That's good. I'm just going to believe that. Is that going to get rid of them? No. You've got to cast them out. Well, you know, Jesus... He, he, he paid the price. He, he's my deliverer. He's my healer. I'm just gonna, he p took all my sickness, disease away. Let's even bring a good example. 1 Peter 2.24 By whose stripes you are healed. Well, that means I'm healed. So I just believe I'm healed. Does that, is that faith? Yes. Is that works of faith? No. Just believing that I'm already healed. Well, the Bible says, by whose stripes you were healed. That is talking about what Jesus did on the cross so that healing now is a part of our right in Christ as a covenant promise. But we need to do something to appropriate that to receive his healing. That's why it tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace, take hold of his mercy, which is healing or pray a prayer of faith. If all we needed to do is believe that by his stripes you were healed, just believe only and not do anything else, then why would we ever have to pray a prayer of faith? There'd be no reason. If I just believe that what Jesus did, that he delivered me from the authority of darkness and translated me into the kingdom, I just, I just believe all the demons are gone. That doesn't do it. The belief of what he's done is one thing, but you've got to work your faith to see the result, don't you? You have to cast out the spirits. You have to take hold of healing. 
you're going to pray a prayer of faith and receive healing to come into you. Why are we instructed to anoint with oil and pray the prayer of faith if we're already healed? Just by believing it's done. See, are you with me? We have people out that are teaching, just believe it's done and that's it. And they never see results. What we see is the scripture shows what Jesus accomplished on the cross. That's what he did for us. By whose stripes you were healed. It means now it belongs to us legally on, because of what Jesus accomplished. But then we have to take hold of it. See, the common teaching in the word of faith is, I believe I'm already healed. Don't run around saying, I'm already healed, if it hasn't manifested in your life. Instead, you say, I take hold of your healing power, and I thank you, it is flowing in my body. That is a work of faith, speaking it into being, and when it's manifested, then you say, I'm already healed. The manifestation. Saying, I'm already healed, when it's not manifested, that's not true. It's actually a lie, isn't it? I'm not going to speak a lie. Speaking a promise that by his stripes you are healed, that it belongs to me, is good. That's belief. I believe that he, by the stripes of Jesus, healing was accomplished for me. Healing is mine. It belongs to me because of what Jesus did. But now I'm going to have works of faith to take hold of healing, to bring it into manifestation in my life. And that is important. Many people in the Word of Faith teaching confess that things are already done. I just believe it's done. Well, that's faith, but that's not works of faith because it's not done until you have worked your faith to see it be done. And that is very important. Doing the Word is working your faith. Now, there's also another thing. Many people in the grace teaching today think that grace from God is automatic to us. Is the grace of God automatic to us? No, it's available to us. If it was automatic and coming in our life, why would we have to come to the throne of grace to find grace to help in time of need? Well, that doesn't line up, does it? It belongs to us as a promise, but you and I have to come and take hold of it. Now, the grace teaching today in a great number of churches is God's grace is automatic. God's in control of all things. He's doing whatever He wants to do in my life. Is God doing whatever He wants to do in my life? Not unless I do what His Word says, so it releases Him to do what He purposes in my life. If I don't obey, does it get done? No. Well, God's favor is toward me because of what Jesus did. Is God in control of everything that I do? No. He's told me his word and told me what to do, but he's given me a free will. I can choose life or I can choose death. I can choose obedience, I can choose disobedience. I can choose to do what he says, or I can choose to reject what he says. If I do what he says, then I allow him to work. I'm working my faith to bring it to pass. If I don't, does it get done? No. The grace teaching says that God's doing all these things and we do nothing, God does everything, and we just watch God do what he wants. It's a lie. It's not the truth. Doing the word is the key. At the same time, the word of faith teaching, which I've come out of, and I went to a word of faith Bible school, and I saw all the errors after I came out of it, says you speak to the mountain one time, and that's it, and believe it's done. I believe that I received one time, it's done. That's it. They have a un false understanding of how faith works. If I speak to a mountain one time and it didn't get moved, is it done? No. Am I supposed to speak to the mountain one time or continuously? That's a good question. Would the word show me? It sure does. Back to Mark 11, chapter 23. You say, Be thou removed, be thou cast in the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith. This word saith, this is the key. How am I saying it? When you look at the tense of the verb, 
It is in the present tense. The present tense in the Greek means continuous, ongoing, repeated action until you see results. Not just one time. Well, I spoke one time, and so that should do it. Well, if it didn't get removed, then it didn't do it. You continue to speak and put your faith in operation until you see the results. Now, this is a work of faith every time I speak. This is where we have someone who speaks one time, works their faith one time, and thinks that that's all they need to do. No. You continually work your faith by speaking to the mountain until the mountain's removed. Same thing with the prayer of faith. The next verse. One of the major teachings in the body of Christ today out there is just believe you receive it's done and that's it. And then you stand, you believe it's done. It is false teaching. How do we know? This is the prayer of faith. What things are we desire when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. How do we know that we're supposed to pray more than once? Because the, the voice, the, the, the tense of all these verbs. This is the first verb. Present tense, continuous repeated action. This is the word pray. Present tense participle, repeated action. This is the word believe. Present tense, imperative mood, continuous repeated action. This is the word receive. You know what it's going to be. Present tense. What does that mean? The prayer of faith is prayed continuously. Every time you pray, you're working your faith, you're working your faith, you're working your faith until you see something come into manifestation. We've got on one hand the one group that says God's in control of all things and everything is just automatic, whatever God does, which means we never work our faith at all, which is wrong. And on the other hand, we've got people that say, I just believe it's already done, or pray one time and believe it's already done, or I'm believing God for such and such. This is a problem because this is contrary to the truth of the Word of God. Our works are to be in operation in order to see results. Again, let me drive this home to you. If you've never heard anything like this, you might think, boy, where in the world did this come from? You've seen it in black and white from the Word. Look at this again. James 2.24, you see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. The faith only teaching is a lie. But the works we're talking about are not works of man or the flesh or what I do. Remember what it said back here? When it talked about what works we're talking about? If it, what's it? Faith. If faith doesn't have works. So this is talking about faith's works. Not works of the flesh or works that I'm doing. It's faith's works. Well, how are faith's works or works of faith put in operation? That's my part and your part by doing what the Word says or speaking what the Word says to put our faith in operation, working our faith that allows Him to accomplish it in our life. And that is so important. Now, having said all that, works are very important. If you don't have the works, then <clears throat> you may have faith, but you don't have works of faith, and it's not going to produce righteousness. Remember what it says? Look here in Acts 10, verse 35. In every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Well, I thought I was accepted with him just because I believe. No. It's, this is present tense for worketh. Every nation, he that's fearing him continually, talking about, and working continually, righteousness is accepted with him. Why? Because your works show forth your faith. If you're not speaking and doing what the Word says, you're not working your faith. It's all evident. And it's, notice, your works produce righteousness. That's working righteousness. It's going to produce an acceptance with Him to be accepted with the Lord. And that's important. Now, when we talk about this work, 
this work of faith. Say, where is this in the Bible? All over the place. Look what it says here, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. Remember without ceasing your work of faith. We work our faith. Working our faith is putting it in operation so he can accomplish what he pleases in our life. And see, as you work your faith, that's also how your faith grows. Because 2 Thessalonians 1, 3 talks about how your faith groweth exceedingly. It's going to become strong by working it, putting it in operation. We see in 2 Thessalonians 1, though, down in verse 11, he prayed a prayer for them. He said, always, wherefore always we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power. The work of faith is going to release the power of God. Where's the power? In the word. How am I doing that? By doing the word and speaking the word. You're working the word is working your faith, putting the power of God in operation in your life. It is so important. Now, we must also understand Matthew chapter 7. These works are important that this is the way we live. Because we look in Matthew chapter 7, verse 20, it says, Wherefore, by their fruits you shall know them. What is fruits? That's evidence of, that's the result of works of faith, right? I have the fruit because I've been doing something. I have the fruit of love because I've been doing what the Word says on love, and it produced the results of love in my life. So fruit is the result of the work of faith in operation, right? You've been working your faith. You're going to know them. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. He says, he says he's, he declares that I'm his Lord. Well, that means that he had faith, and he even declared I'm Lord, so there was a work of faith at some point, and he got born again. So this is talking about someone who calls Jesus Lord, so this is someone who's born again, right? Not everybody's going to enter in the kingdom of heaven. Hmm. Well, why would that be? He, this guy did work his faith at one point. He called him Lord, and he's still calling him Lord. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. The word doeth, present tense, continuous repeated action. So this guy's doing the will, which is, what's the will? The word. So as I'm doing the will or doing the word, what am I doing? I'm working my faith. Because whenever I do the word, I'm working my faith because I'm doing what he told me to do. Right? He goes on and he says, Many will say to me in that day, Many is not a few. This is a whole lot. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? That's past tense. Were they born again? Yeah, they had the Holy Spirit. They had the gift of prophecy. They were prophesying. In thy name have cast out devils. Past tense. Can you cast out demons if you aren't born again? No. You've got to know your authority and you've got to be operating and you're, you're working. They were working their faith. They were casting out the demons. They were prophesying another work of faith. In thy name done many wonderful works. They were doing works of faith. So this guy, these guys were born again, right? We'd all agree they're born again. These guys were in faith. They were working their faith at this point in time. Great. What happened? Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Some people have said, I never knew you. Well, that meant it must be they were never saved. Well, we already know they were saved because we already saw. They called them Lord and they did all these works. You can't do these works if you're not saved and born again and righteous, right? So, what's this talking about? Why does he say, I never knew you? That means there's been a change. He knew them at one point because they were doing the works. Now he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Are they doing the things of God now? No. The word iniquity is a Greek word, anomia, which means lawlessness. Young's brings us out. It's law, anomia. Nomos is the word for law. A means without, without law or no, lawlessness. 
The word work is very important. This is present tense. In other words, were they working God's word anymore? No. They quit doing his word. Now they're working something else. Lawlessness, which means it's contrary to God's word. Remember, it talks about in, when, the, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he's called the lawless one, literally is what it says. And people are walking, and he's the one who's going to have people walking in lawlessness and unrighteousness. These guys were continually, present tense, working lawlessness. So what happens if you're continually working lawlessness? Do you have works of faith anymore? No. Now you're working something else. You know your faith by your works. Are these guys righteous anymore? No. Because they weren't working righteousness anymore. That's why he says, I never knew you. Understanding righteousness, we can show you this from the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 18. Look what it says here. See, God is a just God. Look what it says here in verse... Uh, 21. If the wicked will turn from all his sins that he's committed, he's not walking in sin any longer, and keep all my statutes, now he's doing the word, and do that which is lawful and right, doing the word, that's working his faith, right? He shall surely live, he shall not die. That's good news. All his transgressions, all the sins that he committed, that he has committed, they shall not be mentioned him. The word mentioned means remembered or called to mind. Otherwise, I don't know anything about his sins. They're all gone. Isn't that what happens? We come to the Lord, our sins are washed away, and he doesn't remember our sins or iniquities anymore. That's because we've come to the Lord and we're following him. In his righteousness that he's done, aha, what he's been doing, what is the righteousness that he's doing? That's his works of faith, isn't it? He just wasn't a believer. He was a doer of what he believed. He shall live. Then he comes down. He says, when the righteous, this is the guy who was righteous doing the word, turns away from his righteousness, he's not doing it anymore, and commits iniquity now. Now he's walking in iniquity, sin. And doeth according to the abominations that the wicked man doeth, shall he live? The answer is no. All his righteousness, what he did in the past, that he has done in the past, shall not be mentioned or remembered or called to mind. Just as all of our sins were washed away when we turn to the Lord and walk in his ways, God being just, he can't turn it around and say, well, if you turn away from walking in righteousness and walking in sin, we'll, we'll make an excuse, we'll just let that go. No, he's got to be just. If all your sins get washed away when you turn to righteousness, then he'd have to be just and fair. All your righteousness will be washed away, so to speak, or not remembered if you go walking in ways of sin. And that's what we see. All his righteousness he's done shall not be remembered or called to mind. In his trespass that he's trespassed, in his sin that he has sinned, in them he shall die. Otherwise, it's not remembered. That's why in Matthew chapter 7, in verse 23, he says, I never knew you. That is a statement at that point in time. Your righteousness is all, I don't remember anything about that. Because what are you doing today? Working lawlessness. You're not walking right today. That shows you that works, that faith plus works of faith continually produces salvation and produces righteousness with God, doesn't it? This totally destroys the once saved, always saved teaching, which is a lie. Now let me say this. A lot of people say, oh, how do I know if I'm saved? Am I, really, am I going to be able to keep being saved? If you are saved now, 
and you are doing the word and following Jesus and you never turn from doing what he says, you're saved, you'll always be saved, you're going to stay saved. You're going to stay righteous. You're going to stay in that state. If you decide, I'm not going to have anything more to do with him and I'm going to go out there and do all this other stuff continually, hmm, then you're in trouble. Because your faith plus works of faith Working righteousness makes you accepted. Remember what we saw? That is very important. Look at one other scripture that shows the same thing. This now talks about unrighteousness. Look at the statement that's made here in Luke 13, 23. One said to him, Lord, are there few that be saved? Otherwise, he's thinking, it doesn't look like everybody's going to be saved based on all the teaching he's been bringing forth. He said, strive, this means contend with adversaries and fight, to enter in at the straight gate. The word straight actually means narrow gate. For many, this is the majority out there, I say unto you, will seek to enter in, but shall not be able. Why are they not able or have strength and, and be able to do it? Because, as you'll find out, they weren't doing God's word anymore. They weren't walking in his ways any longer. Once the master of the house has risen up and is shut to the door, you begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. He shall answer and say unto you, I know you not where, whence, from whence you are. I don't know you. Why would God say that, that he doesn't know someone? Again, we're going to find out. What's the, here's their testimony. Then shall you begin to say, We have eaten, past tense, and drunk in thy presence. Thou hast taught in our streets. That means they heard the word, they were in the presence of God, they apparently must have received the word and were walking with him in some measure. They heard the word. But he shall say, I tell you, to, I, uh, say, I tell you, I know you not whence from you are. Depart from me, because now he tells you what they are at this point in time all you workers of unrighteousness. This is a different word. It's a word unrighteousness, adakia. Workers of righteousness, he says, depart. Because now, were they working righteousness any longer? No, they were working unrighteousness now. Workers of unrighteousness. He hears depart from them. He said, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets of the kingdom of God and you yourselves thrust out. That meant these guys were right and accepted and working righteousness and then they quit doing it. Now they were workers of unrighteousness. They quit walking the straight and narrow gate. They started walking their own way. God expects every one of us to choose the way of the Lord. 2 Timothy chapter 2 Verse 19, what does he tell us all as Christians? Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. We already found out the ones that are his are the ones that are working righteousness. And faith with works of faith are declared righteous. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity, which is again the word adakia, unrighteousness. God wants us to depart from that. He goes on and he says, in a great house there's not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. What determines whether you are a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor? Is it God arbitrarily deciding your honor, your dishonor, your honor, your dishonor, and that kind of stuff? No. If a man Therefore, purge, cleanse out himself from these, from what? From the unrighteousness. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified meat for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. In other words, you and I are to cleanse ourselves from the unrighteousness, get rid of it, so we will be righteous, walking in line with righteousness. Otherwise, we've got to depart from unrighteousness. Can we be righteous and walk in an unrighteousness? No. You're kidding yourself. 
He does not want us to walk in these ways whatsoever. What's going to happen in the end times? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 says, there's going to be a falling away first. Falling away is the word apostasy. Apostasia, which means it's apostasy, which is someone who turned away from the truth. They're not following the Lord anymore. And the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that's called God, that's worshipped, so that he is God, sit in the temple of God, showing himself he's God, he's going to be proclaiming that. Of course, it's all a lie. It comes down here, it calls him for the mystery of the iniquity, which is a, 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 a mystery, and this is the word anomia, which means lawlessness again. The mystery of lawlessness already works. It's been working. And who's the one? The lawless one. It speaks of him. Then shall the wicked or the lawless one, Animus, he's the lawless one, he'll be revealed, and he's going to lead people down a path of not doing righteousness any longer. Instead, he'll lead them in a path of not doing the word. The Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. He'll be wiped out. He's going to come with the working of Satan with power, signs, and lying wonders. That's why you can't follow signs and wonders. Or you, could be, you, could, you could make a mistake. You've got to follow the word. But the multitudes will follow the lying signs and wonders because they don't know the word. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. See, if they don't receive the word of God, the truth, that's going to produce the salvation, but instead they get deceived by the unrighteousness, they're just walking according to the way of unrighteousness and become workers of unrighteousness, they're in trouble. Just like he said, I don't know where who you are. Depart from me. God knows you of what you are today. He will know you tomorrow of what you are tomorrow. He will know you the next day for what you are the next day. He knows you of what you are at a point in time where your faith and your walk is important. Consistency. Your works are extremely important in your life. Absolutely. What happens to the guys that have the works of the flesh? Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. The works of the flesh. Mm, that's not doing the word. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and of such like. Of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, they which do or practice or exercise such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Or are these guys walking in the way of the word? No. And the word is a present tense, which meant this is what they're continually doing. They're not walking with the Lord. They're not doing his word. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Otherwise, what counts with God is faith and works of faith. Not just faith only. We have a great problem in the body of Christ because we've got one hand, one people that says it's faith only, alone, and they, they think your works mean nothing. And on the other hand, we've got people that are out there working the law, law and going back to Old Testament ways and doing all this and thinks that my works, and they're not, they haven't even been born again and received Jesus. They're in trouble. And then we have some people that think I can just work and do whatever I want to do. Well, I can do some good things, and I can do, you know, it doesn't matter if I do these other things. Well, one last scripture. What happens to the guy who has a combination of good works and bad works? Revelation 3. This is to the church at Laodicea. I know thy works. Remember in Revelation 2 and 3, he says to each one of those churches, the first thing out of his mouth, 
I've known their works, 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 I've known their works. He didn't say, I've known your faith. He didn't say, oh, I see you're born again. In fact, we knew them all. They all were because they were in the church. He says, I know your works. Why? Because your works are works of faith showing whether you're the real deal or not. Whether you're following the Lord or not. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold, that means your works are no good, or hot, means your works are doing right. I would that you were cold or hot. If you're cold, I at least get a hold of you, try to get you turned around. If you're hot, you know, you're in good shape, of course. He says, then because you're lukewarm. What's lukewarm? A combination of cold and hot. That they got some of the good, and they got some of the bad. They got some righteous things, they got some unrighteous things. Neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Is that somebody that's saved? Is that somebody that's going to be with the Lord? No way. That means your works are extremely important. That's what God wants. He wants you to walk the walk of the Lord. He wants you to follow after him and do the things that he says. You and I must make the decision that we're going to follow him and put him absolutely first place in our life. Because every one of us are going to be judged according to our works. He comes down and he says, even at Revelation, the very end, in Revelation 22, in verse 12, he says, Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Whatever our work is. Of course, what did he tell the Laodicean church? He said, repent. I'm, be zealous and repent. Get away from this stuff. These guys were basically walking in the flesh. They believed in Jesus, but they weren't following him. They weren't doing what he said. They weren't clothed with the garments of God, putting the, the things of God on. They were just walking their own walk. No. God's going to give us everyone according to works. Your works show forth your faith. What you do is showing forth whether you're really following him or not. So we've seen something today. We are saved and we are declared righteous by faith and works of faith. Not by faith only, and not by works only, that's for sure, but by faith and works of faith. When you do the word, you're working your faith. When you speak the word, you're working your faith. When you obey the word, you're working your faith. When you're obeying and doing what the word says, you're following Jesus. You're following the way of righteousness. Now, does the, if the guy just totally turns away and he walks in lawlessness, he's going to hear it depart. That's a, quite a sobering thought. I don't you have any fear, but you, you, you just be committed wholly to walk in the way of the Lord and follow Him. You're, you have absolute security that you're saved and you're going to stay saved. But at the same time, this does show that your works are important. I said that was the last one, but I do have to show you this. The Lord brings this to mind. Matthew 24, verse 12. I want you to look at this. This is in the time of the end times, Matthew 24, end time chapter, about all the different things, wars, rumors of wars, all these different things, nations and so forth, the end time things happening, false prophets arising, deceiving many. Then he says, because iniquity, this is this word lawlessness we've seen before, anomia, because lawlessness shall abound. What do we see happening in the world today? Lawlessness is increasing and increasing, and it's going to increase and abound tremendously. The love of many shall wax cold. What's love? This is the word agape. Is that talking about the world? No. Some people, oh, this is talking about the Jews. No. Agape love is not, it's not for, it's, that's for people that are born again. Agape, remember that's a new kind of love we get when we're born again? The agape love of many, that's Christians, 
shall wax cold. Why? Because the lawlessness has gotten a hold of them. They're walking in lawlessness. They're walking in the ways of the world. They're walking the ways contrary to the word. They're not following the word. That's the falling away of the great apostasy. They defected from the truth. They don't have the love of the truth any longer. They just do whatever I want to do. You can't walk that walk or you're in trouble. You got to put the word of God first place. These guys, if they're cold, you know if the lukewarm are in trouble, you know what's going to happen to cold. That's why God wants us to make the decision. We're going to walk with the Lord. And that's why understanding works is extremely important. We can't believe these lies. I'm saved by faith alone. And it doesn't matter what I do. This has given rise to even one of the lying teachings that says, your sins are forgiven past, present, and future. It doesn't matter what you do. Jesus takes care of them all. That's crazy. All the sins you commit, you're going to have to confess them or you're in trouble. They're not forgiven future. They're only forgiven if you act on the word. The provision for them to be forgiven forevermore is there, but you're going to have to confess them. You're going to have to repent and turn from them. You're going to have to walk the walk. This is given, these are type of teachings that go forth in denominations and in groups of Christians all over the world. It's total deception. We see lots of problems. That's why we got to know the truth. That's why our works are important. Say this with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word that gives me revelation about works. I understand that I am declared righteous because of faith and works of faith, showing forth that I am doing your word, working righteousness, walking in your ways. I thank you, Lord. I will never turn away from doing the word of God. I will always do the word of righteousness, do what you say, and follow you. I will never follow lawlessness or unrighteousness or do anything that's contrary to your word. I will walk the straight and narrow way. I will show forth my faith by my works, by the fruit of what I am walking after in my life. I am a hearer and a doer of your word. I have faith and works of faith, and I am righteous, accepted with you. I am saved. I'm going to enter in to eternal life, into the kingdom of heaven. I thank you, Lord, that I will make sure that I always have faith and works of faith all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. It's an important message. If you never heard anything like that, this, which you may not have, you might think, well, I never heard anything like this. Because you won't hear it out there in most places because they're not teaching the whole word of God, unfortunately. This is the truth. This will keep the fear of God before you all the day of your life. The Bible says we're supposed to be in the fear of God all the day long. I'm not about to depart from God's ways. I'm not about to give place to the enemy, the deceitfulness of sin that will harden your heart and take you down a path of destruction. Just think of all those Christians that were walking with God once and they got deceived and then, well, how'd you get over there? They ain't even with the Lord anymore. They're in trouble. See, well, I'm standing on it. I can't fall. No, the Bible says take heed. Let anybody thinks that they can't fall. We're going to make our calling election sure by doing the word of God consistently following the way of the Lord. You walk the walk and you follow him, you're going to be always righteous and right with the Lord. Praise God. We can have absolute assurance and confidence, but we know we're going to walk the walk. Doers, not hearers only. See the guys that are hearers only, they deceive themselves because they haven't been doing it. Doers, show forth that you're really following the Lord. That's why he says, I know your works, because your works show whether you really are the real deal or not. Father, I thank you and praise you for all you brought forth. Thank you for the revelation of understanding works. 
And thank you, Father, for all that you're going to accomplish as we are going to look at the scriptures about works. And we thank you that we're going to see all the things that you want us to do. And we're going to walk this walk, and we're going to follow you, and we're going to see you accomplish everything in our life. Thank you for us, each one, being continual hearers and doers of your word all the days of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Tonight.